everybody. Let me try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Ah, that's better. Welcome to Inside da Azure Data Center Architecture. My name is Mark Krasinovich. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Azure. Just uh, want to get an idea for how many people have seen one of these types of presentations before. How many people were here at last build and saw the presentation? So quite a yeah, good number of you. So those of you that have been here know what to expect. Those of you that are new, welcome. What I've got for you this morning is about an hour, which isn't a whole lot of time to cover a topic this big. So what I've done is taken some of the really cool things that we're doing or have done or plan to do in each of these different areas, show you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, give you an idea of what goes into the technology and some of the architecture behind it, and some of our vision for how we're bringing out computing, not just to the public cloud, but also to the edge. The frustrating thing about this talk is the length. And whenever I put together one of these talks, it's always three hours of content that I've got to pare down to just an hour. So that's the frustrating part. But I've got an action-packed session, so I'm going to be moving at a pretty good clip. You can see there's seven different areas. I'll start with data centers, talk about servers, our network infrastructure, both physical and, and software-based, talk about our application manager, our Azure resource manager, some of the cool things we're doing there, talk about storage, and then our data platforms, Cosmos DB and SQL. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about AI and the intersection of AI and Azure. So let's start with data centers. And those of you who have seen Satya's talk or seen other presentations about what Azure is know that it's a global cloud. It's in 54 regions, 44 of them active, 10 announced. We're on six of the seven continents at this point in time. And I have no doubt that we'll end up being in Antarctica at some point. And it's probably not going to be an Azure data center. It's probably going to be an Azure stack there, hopefully, uh, that's going to be doing research there at the South Pole. But this continues to expand. And the reason that we do that is, of course, because customers want data within their country borders for data sovereignty, for compliance and regulation, and also just so that it's close to wherever their customers are and the workloads are in their own enterprise data centers. When it comes to the physical architecture of our data centers, We've been moving towards availability zones, and we've introduced availability zones in a bunch of our regions. You're going to see more come online with availability zones. The availability zones are for HA within a region. So the idea is you've got physically isolated data centers, three of them ideally or more, where you can create a workload that spans across them and synchronizes, synchronously copies data between them so that if one data center experiences, for example, a flood in the local area or a power outage, that your, even your quorum-based durable storage application continues to operate. And this is what we build our own software architectures on top of. With, we also have a, a geo architecture or strategy where we put in two regions within a geo. So for example, if you take a look at what we're doing in Switzerland or France or the UK, there's two regions. One of them is, serves, or they both are paired together. And so you can go into one of them and create an application that probably asynchronously replicates most of its data between them. Because of the distance between them, we typically want to make that hundreds of miles apart so they can survive large-scale local uh, disasters in the region, like, for example, electric grid failure or an earthquake. Now, we're all kind of nerdy here, and I love looking at this stuff. I don't get enough opportunities to go out and visit our data centers. There's one in Quincy that we offer tours to some of our customers for, but I think one of the things that really strikes you is looking at pictures and looking at the scale, especially the scale that the cloud is growing towards. This is Virginia, so this is our Boynton data centers here, and you can see this is 2014. There's a few data centers in that picture. And then this is 2017. And so a bunch more data centers, and you can see there's more data centers being built below the level of the picture. So quite a big expansion just in that area. And that's one of our larger regions that we're building out. Here's Quincy, the data center that I just mentioned that's over on the Columbia River. We strive for ha being using renewable energy sources. The Columbia River is a great source of renewable energy. Each one of those facilities right there is 8 megawatts in size. So you're looking at 64 megawatts of data center there. This is just a fraction of what Quincy is today. And it continues to grow out there, too. And I don't know why this is uh... OK. I don't know. Um, so that's a fraction of 
That's really kind of obnoxious. Oh, I get to use this mic now? All right. So I feel like a game show host now. <laughs> All right, so here's another picture. And this one I, I really like because it shows the evolution of our data center architectures over time. This is in Dublin. The data center names, you can see there, DB3 and DB4. The first data center that we built there in Dublin was back in 2007. DB3 was built in 2009, DB4 in 2010. And then you can see DB5 there, which is built in 2011. And we've continued to build out Dublin. So there's what we were just looking at. There's DB6, which came online a couple years later. Here's DB7, which came online in 2017. And here's DB8, which came online last year. And you can see that there's more space there uh, over to the right for more build out in Dublin. Uh, and up there, too. Build out of uh, the future campus works up there, to, uh, replacing that parking lot with more data centers. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's going on inside those data centers by looking at our servers. So I want to take you through our general purpose servers as they've evolved over time. I'll start with our Gen 2. Our Gen 2, I just have there as for reference. This is what we launched with in 2010. This is a two-socket AMD Opteron system with 32 gigabytes of memory and a whopping one gigabit network adapter on top of it. Then you can see that as we introduced new versions of servers, we had larger and larger customer workloads coming onto the platform demanding huge amounts of RAM and compute to go with it. We introduced this about three years ago. This is the, what we internally called the Godzilla server. How many of you have ever deployed a G series server? So a few of you. That is what Godzilla is. And at the time, it was the largest virtual machine in the public cloud with 512 gigabytes of RAM in it. Then a couple years ago, we introduced our Gen 6 server. This is a Project Olympus open compute project based server. This one, you can see already at this point in time, has more RAM than Godzilla did just a year and a half before. And we're up to 40 gigabit networks at this point in time. We're up to only flash on the servers. We also have an optimized Gen 6. This is for the mainstream compute workload. So we've got high memory Gen 6, optimized Gen 6. You can see the difference here is the amount of RAM on the system. And then we're about to start rolling out optimized Gen 7 servers. Now you can see that. The difference here between Gen 6 and Gen 7, in terms of processor power, there's a few more cores on it. It also, the, another big difference here is that it's got an extra terabyte of SSD on it, but the big one is that we've gone from 40 gigabit to 50 gigabit networking on it. So this is what we've got on our general fleet now is going to 50 gigabit. Obviously, 100 gigabit's not gonna be too far off in the future, and 200 gigabit right after that, we're already planning the roadmap for that networking expansion. Then. We introduced this a couple years ago. This, this was kind of the, the son of Godzilla. We called it Beast. This, again, was the largest pub virtual machine in the public cloud at the time we released it, four terabytes of RAM on it. But customers were keep bringing on more workloads. The big one is SAP HANA, and they've just, some of the larger enterprises have huge HANA deployments that they're moving to the public cloud, and they wanted more RAM than this. So we introduced this. This is uh, Beast V2, son of Beast. Uh, son of a beast, you don't want to call it that, but it's got 12 terabytes <laughs> of RAM on it, and it's got 448 cores on it. It's got eight sockets, so it is quite a large machine. And then we also go to the other end of the spectrum with hardware in Azure. This is Azure Sphere. <laughs> it's got four megabytes of RAM on it, and this is uh, relative to beast. Um, we it's not to size there, so we wanted to show you uh, precisely how big it is. Now, we're also, if you take a look at trends in hardware, the, there's more and more demand for high performance computing in the form of GPUs. And you can see some of those GPUs, the NVIDIA DX2 is 10 kilowatts in a server. The NVIDIA V100 is 300 watts in a server. You can see the graph there showing the wattage uh, off of cores over time has continued to grow. But the thermal envelope that the processors have to operate at continues to drop per processor. So you can see that's the orange line there that you can see is the decreasing line. So we've got a challenge, uh, two things that aren't compatible, air cooling and the drive for more wattage in a smaller amount of space. So we're, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're looking at here, this is the Olympus Gen 6 chassis. It's fully air cooled. But we are uh, cloud and operations and innovation group, which is 
and charged with building our data centers is exploring a bunch of new technologies to optimize the data center. And one of them is liquid cooling. And so you can see we've got multiple efforts looking at different types of liquid cooling. This is microchannel coal plates. You can see those cables, those tubes, those are carrying water. And so this is a combination, a hybrid of air and water cooled. Then you can see this, which is the one phase immersion technology. So go in there and you can see that this thing, this motherboard is actually sitting in liquid being cooled. But we're going a step further with phase two immersion, looking at that, and this is the whole thing <laughs> in liquid. And this is a, a liquid with a very low boiling temperature, so it dissipates the heat off coming off the servers uh, really quickly. So that's a look at servers. Now, servers, we've got a challenge with, our, with servers and hardware fails. Hardware has spontaneous failures that are transient in nature. We also sometimes have issues with the software that runs on the server. It's where it might be a memory leak or a corruption shows up because of a hardware issue. And we've got a crash of the operating system or the hypervisor. We've got a project that we're working on, Project Tardigrade. How many people have heard of a tardigrade? So also called a water bear. This creature right here is one of the most durable creatures ever discovered. It actually can survive in outer space. It's the only known animal that can survive in outer space. It can survive at extreme temperatures of hundreds of degrees. It can survive in the ocean floor. So it's been everywhere. It's, it's been found in volcanoes. And so really, we named this project because we want our servers to be like tardigrade. And when, it ha when we detect a hardware failure, when a server is about to uh, reboot, has a hardware failure, uh, and it sends a signal into the operating system, or the operating system itself has an issue and we want to clean it out by rebooting back into a, a server, we don't want to actually reboot the VMs, especially one of those 12 terabyte VMs. So if you take a look here, host failures today, if the host platform goes down for hardware software reasons, obviously the VMs die instantly and then they have to reboot. With Project Tardigrade, something happens to the host platform, those VMs, are frozen in RAM, their state's preserved, the operating system reboots underneath them, and then they're resumed. And I've got a demo of that for you to see that in action. So here I've got a KVM uh, where I'm going to connect, and it has to be a KVM because we're going to be looking at the server display, the output from the server itself. And how many people have seen a blue screen on a server hosting VMs before in your own data centers? So just a few of you. Well, this technology, I think you'd uh, agree, would be something nice to have. Okay, so let me explain what you're looking at here. This is an Azure test server. On the right side, you see a virtual machine. This is a virtual machine, an Azure virtual machine. You can see that there's a script running in it that's just got a counter that's being incremented. So this is representing some workload. Then on the left side is a tool that I wrote <laughs> called Not My Fault. And I called it Not My Fault because if you use this tool, whatever happens is not my fault. <laughs> now one of the things you can do to it is cause blue screens. And so what I'm going to do is blue screen this server on the host. So I press the crash button. We lose the signal because the server has actually gone down. The host is rebooting. You're going to see it's back up. The virtual machine is going to reconnect the display. And the counter continues. So that's a look at tardigrade. Now, the other types of hardware that we're working on is quantum computers, and I thought I'd give you a look at what quantum computers look like. Uh, just for those of you that haven't seen a description of quantum computing and what it entails, besides our work on software for quantum computing, it requires pretty intense hardware work, including new material science and extreme temperatures. You can see the temperature scale here. The quantum computer itself, the processor, has to run at just a few millikelvin. It's literally the coldest 
place in the universe. Uh, deep space is actually warmer. It's several degrees Kelvin. And so you can see there just above uh, about two degrees Kelvin. Then we have to have a cryogenic computer that's running at four degrees Kelvin, cooled by liquid helium just to control that quantum processor. Then RAM can't operate at those temperatures. We can get RAM operating at 77 degrees Kel Kelvin, which is there with cooled with liquid nitrogen. And here's some pictures that you can see. Uh, now this looks like a Sam Adams brewery, but it's not. This is uh, Torvald working on a wiring a one of those refrigerators that we just saw. He, he's at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Then you can see this is uh, Peter Krogstrup. He's also working in uh, Denmark in Lingby. And this is a molecular beam epitax epitaxy machine, uh, MBE, which is used to create the surface that the quantum processor is built on top of uh, by uh, doing uh, lithography and dropping materials onto it with etching. Uh, here's one of those liquid nitrogen tanks. This is, he's cooling the quantum refrigerator, uh, refilling the canister for it that's going to go in that uh, that cooling tower that we saw before. And then finally, this is in Redmond here because we opened a quantum lab here in Redmond where we're building quantum computers. And this is Rich Rouse working on the probe that holds the quantum chip in the Redmond lab. Now I've got an exciting announcement here at Build that we're taking our Q-sharp language along with the SDK and the simulator and the tutorials, the CATA tutorials for quantum computing, and we've, we're open sourcing the whole thing. It's all going to go into GitHub. idea is that you can go and do pull requests on it. You can debug your code by looking at what's going on underneath the hood. And we also want to reach the open community that will, wants to use open source tooling. So that's, uh, we're excited about making that announcement here. Now let's take a look at networking. And this slide just shows you the spectrum of networking. It's gigantic. And uh, going from the left, which is the Azure regions itself, to the core WAN, the regional networks which connect to the core WAN, which connect to the edge and CDN and express route out to the outside world, whether it's a customer coming over the internet, enterprise coming over express route, or internet exchange. And We've got a physical infrastructure for that core WAN that's over 100,000 miles of, of fiber and subsea cable. We've la la just laid in the last couple years two of the largest subsea cables ever put down, one of them between Virginia and Spain, which is 4,000 miles long, and it has the highest bandwidth of any subsea cable ever laid so far, 160 terabits of bandwidth in that cable. So we continue to build out this infrastructure, and actually if you enter our backbone, which you can do with Azure Virtual WAN, anywhere in the world, and transmit to any other region of Azure, or go out through an express route connection on the other side of the world, you'll be traveling completely over this dark fiber network. Speaking of edge, because edge is a big theme for us, of course, intelligent cloud, intelligent edge, one of the announcements we made just in the last six months is Azure Front Door Service. This is a service that we've been using internally to power Office and Xbox. And now this is a public, publicly available service. This is any cast IP routing. So now uh, we've got two ways to get failovers between regions and routing. One of them is through Azure Traffic Manager and DNS. And this one is using any cast IP addresses. So it's a little bit more flexible. And the idea here is that you can SSL terminate, HTTP termination here. You can obviously get a bunch of protections for your application out on the edge before it ever shows up in your application. Another big effort that we've got going on in networking is support for containers. Containers are the way that cloud native applications are packaged and deployed. And so we want to make containers a first class citizen in the Azure cloud. One of the requirements we had is we want to pack different containers from different virtual networks, which could be the virtual networks from the same customer or virtual networks from different customers on the same virtual machines. And only the container orchestrator knows which container from which customer is going to be on which virtual machine. So we wanted to delegate control to the orchestrator to be able to plumb the core IP addresses of virtual networks into those virtual machines. And that's what you see here. There's a master node, for example, for a Kubernetes cluster. 
And there's a delegated network controller that, there, a component that runs as part of Kubernetes that gets information from the host network monitor or network management agent, which is part of the networking service that talks to the regional control plane there to say, hey, I've got an IP address from this virtual network that needs to map to this particular container. And the de delegated network controller will then talk to its agents on the worker nodes to plumb those IP addresses in there and tell the network, hey, this IP address of this virtual network is sitting on this virtual machine right now. So full first class support, now that means all your network security group rules, all your routing rules, all of that applies uniformly to virtual machines and containers. And you're seeing that light up with Azure Functions, Azure Container uh, Instances, Service Fabric Mesh, and AKS. So let's take a look at the compute architecture now. Uh, this is an overall picture of the Azure architecture. And I'll stop here for a second just describe what you're looking at. Obviously very, very high level and abstract, but at the bottom you see the Azure infrastructure. These are the servers that we were looking at before. Above that is the Azure Hardware Manager. Internally it's codenamed Autopilot. This is what manages the life cycle and health of those servers. So re-imaging them, rebooting them, detecting if there's problems on those servers. And then we've got a component called the Azure Fabric Controller. The Fabric Controller is responsible for allocating virtual machines and placing them on servers and managing the life cycle of those virtual machines. It is part of the core compute platform, but it doesn't work without networking and storage, of course. So if we drilled into a server, you would see what we saw on the previous slide of the network management agent sitting there, which would be talking to the compute agent, the Fabric Controller's compute agent sitting there that would tie, connect a virtual machine with networking. Above the fabric controller, where you've got a virtual machine layer now, we build our own services. So if you take a look, compute network storage there, those are called resource providers. If you're familiar with Azure Resource Manager, these are actually resource providers that provide the virtual machine abstractions, and then they talk to the Azure fabric controller and the network services. We call compute network and storage the core RPs or XRPs. They're built on top of service fabric. They run on top of virtual machines, just like customer virtual machines do, and operate that layer of the abstraction. Then you can see that there's the dot, 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 and that's because we have many, many resource providers, each one providing its own definition of objects and APIs that sitting underneath Azure Resource Manager, which is that line up there, give a consistent experience across our services when it comes to role-based access control and policy and monitoring. Above that, of course, talking to the Azure Resource Manager control plane APIs, the Azure Portal, the CLI, and PowerShell, and third-party uh, tools that talk directly to those REST APIs. Vertically, authentication, which is an Azure Active Directory. Just a little inside detail here. We use a, a version of AED that is we call data center uh, security token service, DSTS, down at the core layer. So we don't want to take, uh, we, we care about the architecture and dependencies, so we don't take a dependency upward in the stack. The lower levels of the stack can't depend on AAD, which is built on Azure itself, and so it's using a mini version of AAD down at those lower layers. Now, Azure Resource Manager, because it's so fundamental to the entire Azure experience, means that we've got a bunch of efforts going on to expand its capabilities in some kind of cool ways that I thought you should be aware of. One of them, as developers, one of them, in, or ISVs, one of them is uh, managed applications. How many people have heard of Azure Managed Applications? Just uh, curious. So just a few of you. What Azure Managed Applications do is let you take an Azure Resource Manager template, put it in our marketplace, and then have a customer go deploy it into their subscription. So it might consist of a few virtual machines, a Cosmos DB database, a uh, gateway on it. That's your application. They deploy their own private version, but you get to see it in your own subscription. So it, those resources are projected from the customer subscription into yours. And now you get to control it, manage it, update it on their behalf. You got also can prevent them from making changes that you aren't acceptable to you or in your application. We've actually started building our own services using this in some cases. So if you're familiar with Azure Databricks, 
When you go deploy Azure Databricks, you're deploy using Azure Managed Applications. And Azure Red Hat OpenShift, the same thing, built on Azure Managed Applications. But you saw resource providers, and we have our own resource provider SDK internally in Azure and that we make available to some of the ISVs that we work with closely to onboard their services into Azure's control plane. But we want to expand that. So we've always had this vision that we're finally getting to now of letting you define your own resource providers and define it in a scope that is as small as a resource group. Idea here is you deploy an application and you want that application now to be accessible through Azure Resource Manager APIs. So, and if you use Swagger, then you can auto-generate SDKs for it so that customers can use the Azure CLI or PowerShell to interact with your app resources in your application that are custom. And you don't have to register these as global resource providers. They're part of the application's deployment. So let me show you an example of that in action, which I think is kind of cool. Just to show you the power of this, because the other thing you get from it is you can make these applications part of your uh, a template. So you can give it to customers and they can deploy it, and now they'll instantiate your resources inside their resource groups. So to demonstrate this, we've created a little demo app. It's uh, Parnell Aerospace, and the idea is that you can enlist cadets in it by filling in name, location, department. This is the web UI. Here are the list of cadets that we've got right now enlisted. But this is implemented, the cadet object, as a custom resource provider. And if we go take a look at the custom resource provider template, this is what you would submit, and your customers would deploy this first into their subscription. And you can see that here, custom providers, resource providers, and the one that we're implementing here is Space Cadet. And it's a proxy provider. It's outside of Azure. And you can see here, this is actually a pointer into that web app. So when we call through Azure Resource Manager, we will actually be calling into that web app that we're looking at there. And we're going to do that by deploying a Space Cadet. And so here's the Azure Resource Manager template for deploying a Space Cadet. You can see down here, we see type Space Cadet. And we're creating a new Space Cadet. And then the parameters from above are filled in. And when we deploy this using Azure, So I'm going to fill in myself. Actually, I'm going to be in the moon. And I'm going to be in Azure department. Oops. Oh. And actually, the resource group is Parnell Aerospace. And there we go. So I'm deploying it into that resource group that has that registered resource provider in a few seconds. This is going to finish deploying, and we're going to go back and see that this actually created a Space Cadet object in that application. And there it went. So if we go to that resource group and we take a look at the activity log, this will refresh in a second, a few seconds here. What we're going to see is the Space Cadet being logged by Azure. And if I do a refresh here, and there it is. So we deployed this Space Cadet object through this custom resource provider registered in that resource group through the Azure control plane into this web application. So really bringing this object type into, and here you can see it's writing the Space Cadet object through the Azure Resource Manager API. So you get logging for this. The idea is that we're fleshing this out so that you can custom define resource types and uh, implement them at the scope of a resource group, a subscription, or an AED tenant. And once you've defined these types, then you can use Azure Resource Manager templates and the other APIs to leverage Azure's control plane and have these show up. And eventually, they'll show up directly in the portal. So they'll look just like any other native Azure resource. All right, let's talk a little bit about storage now. And the storage architecture has been one that's been evolving over time. This is a, a high-level view of the Azure storage architecture that implements blobs and queues. And 
as well as these other APIs. Before I get to the APIs, let's just take a look at the architecture. There's stateless load balancer front ends, or stateless load balancers, which is just using our internal Azure load balancer. There's front ends here. These are stateless front ends that have caches on them. Then there's a partition layer. This partition layer keeps track of where different blob extents are located. And this is where your partitioning scheme comes into play because this determines which partition, partition table server gets your particular partition and will index on it and do queries. You can see there's geo-replication, so this is where we would replicate your account if you've got a GRS account between two regions. And then at the bottom, this distributed file system layer, that is where we call the stream layer or the extent layer. This is where the blobs, chunks, are managed and deployed on individual servers. Replicated at least three times logically, uh, done with erasure coding in many cases to save storage. Now one of the challenges we've had up until very recently is that this architecture right here was represented with a single stamp. And we would go into a region, we'd create multiple stamps. Your storage account would go into one of these stamps. And so your blobs are in one of those stamps. And that's worked well as Azure's grown up to this point, but we've got, cu got customers that are demanding huge amounts of bandwidth into their storage accounts or their blobs and huge amounts of, uh, and huge amounts of capacity, Lar very large blobs, very large storage accounts. So we've been working for the last few years and last, late last year announced Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. This is built on top of the limit, lim what we call the limitless storage architecture where we take each of those layers now and they can leverage any of the stamps, the, the components from any stamp in the data center on the layer below it. Whether it's the table servers, the front end's talking to table servers or the table servers talking to extent servers. And that means that we can actually create a storage account that can leverage every byte of storage in a data center and every uh, byte per second of network bandwidth in the data center as well. So now we support petabyte size files and exabyte size storage accounts with huge amounts of bandwidth. And that, on top of it, you can see this, the trend here across Azure services, which you're gonna see time and again, to have multiple different APIs built on top of the same underlying infrastructure. And rather than going and creating a new HDFS stack, we already had this blob stack, HDFS files, map, we can map those to blobs, we can add a layer for HDFS permissions and the directory hierarchy, and now we've got that built on the exact same substrate. So HDFS and the Blob API on, built on top of this ADLS Gen 2. Eventually, you'll be able to access the same data using different APIs here, and that's kind of the vision that we've got across our services is multiple APIs on top of the same infrastructure which allows you to access the same data in place using different APIs. Now, something else we're working on, and you're gonna see this is a trend in the public cloud as well, is pushing compute close to storage. Despite the fact that network bandwidth continues to increase, we went from one gigabit to 10 to 40 to 50 to 100 to 200, it's still, you don't wanna waste network bandwidth. You don't wanna waste time if you can do a distributed query right on the data without pulling that, having to pull that data out and do the query outside. So we've got, Two features that are coming online here in Azure Storage, one of them is called Azure Blob Index. The idea here is you've got an application that's putting data across lots of different blobs. And you want to have some index where you can quickly, efficiently find a blob that matches your query without having to go and do that query by pulling data out and indexing it and processing that query. You want to let that query happen right in the storage layer to find a blob of interest. So you create some tags here. You can see arbitrary key value pairs. You send those to the blob storage account. And then blob indexing engine attaches these to the blobs, indexes them so that queries, like if you do this query of where status equals this and that and that, then it's gonna find the appropriate blob to show you are blobs that match that query index. And I've got a second feature that we're coming out with, and this is Azure Blob Quick Query. We, once you've identified a particular blob, 
Now you want to do a query of the contents of that blob without having to read the whole blob out and do it yourself. So this is pushing the compute close to the storage, which saves you network egress charges, it saves you network bandwidth, it saves you latency. And the available options that you got today is you can actually run custom code to parse and filter or upload from blob to SQL Azure and then run a query or spin up Hadoop cluster, but with this, you can do direct SQL type queries directly on it. So the idea here is select from a blob where column one is greater than column two. This gets the blob, gets the block info, aggregates the results, do the query across those blobs, aggregates the results, and then returns them to you. So let's go take a look at that in action. So here I've got Azure Storage Explorer. Now one of the things that I've always wanted to know is how many copies of my books the local library has here in Seattle. So what we've done is uploaded uh, blobs of the catalogs of lots of libraries. Now, to be honest, some of these are artificial, some of these are real library catalogs. You can see that there's files that are very in size, roughly one gigabyte, and we've got 10,000 of them. So this is a huge amount of data, multiple terabytes of data. And what I want to do is go find the blobs that have my, that are here in Seattle, and then find how many books of mine they've got. Because, th and by the way, this is CSV, so it's unstructured storage that we're going to be scanning. So it's not r really amenable to putting this in a database, pulling it out and putting a database right now. So we say look up, and this is a, a storage client application which is calling those blob query APIs, the lookup API that you just saw, and saying look up city equals Seattle. It comes back with six of those CSV files. Now I want to find which ones are libraries. We find one, the Seattle library here, so we want to query that one. And this is where I'm going to switch over. That was doing the metadata tag queries on those blobs to find out which ones are Seattle libraries. Now I'm going to do a SQL query of that Seattle library, and here's the select from blob storage where author equals Racinovich. And blob storage is a reference back to that blob that the application will execute. So you can see, pretty excited by these results, quite a few copies of my books. By the way, how many people have read at least one of those? Novels, okay. How, how about one of the thick nonfiction books? Okay, there's quite a few of you that have uh, some book reading to do and you can go read the library <laughs> or you can buy it online if you want. Um, and then you can do more complicated queries like here I'm gonna say, in the publication year, which is one of those fields in the, the CSV file, it's an arbitrary field, unindexed, and we're doing scans across the whole file, aggregating the results, and this is gonna tell how many of them were published after 2016, because that's one of the fields in the CSV files. And the only book that I've published since then is uh, Troubleshooting with the SysInternals Tools. So that, we're gonna see how many copies, and the library has seven copies of that book, which even blew my mind. Uh, so. So anyway, so that uh, shows you kind of serverless storage, and this is a trend that you're gonna see across data services of pushing compute to storage. Now the next thing I'm gonna talk about is something called Project Zipline. This is an ASIC that we're putting in our storage servers. To, this is the uh, first custom silicon, custom design for going into our storage servers to do acceleration for data processing, specifically CRC, encryption, and compression. And this offloads that from the CPUs. It, supports, it's got four 25 gigabytes per second channels to drive 100 gigabytes per second through this card. I've actually got a, a one of these cards up here to show you. It supports a bunch of different compression, a bunch of different encryption algorithms, including zipline encryption, which we contributed to OCP just a couple months ago. Here's one of those cards. I was gonna throw it out into the audience, but somebody told me that wouldn't be a good idea. So. <laughs> So that's a look at how we're starting to build custom hardware, where we've been building custom hardware for our data centers. Now here's a, a further reaching project. This is called Project Silica, and this is us looking further out into the future. We, with MSR and University of Southampton in Wales and Azure, we're exploring storing data in glass. 
you can see that the densities that we get there, we could put a terabyte in the, today in the size of a DVD in the future that we project that we'll be able to get up to 360 terabytes in the size of a DVD platter. So super high density. And the cool thing about this, and you can see that it's just etching with femtosecond lasers, voxels into the glass, and multiple layers. We're at 120 layers now. And to read it, you just flash light and then look at the reflections. And you can see, using those reflections, you can determine the polarization and, and retardance of those voxels and then read bits out of it. And this is a three-bit voxel, but we're now up to eight, 10-bit voxels at 120 layers of depth, and that's how we're getting towards this density. Now, somebody will say, well, glass, that's pretty fragile, huh? Oh, by the way, here's zero day that they've encoded in a piece of glass for me. That's the title, uh, the cover of the book, and then that little blue section up there, that's where the zero day text is encoded. So uh, when I get my microscope, I'm gonna go read it again. Now here's a demonstration of just how durable this is compared to standard media. So there's a comparison of reading on class that didn't go through that with class. So all the glass naysayers, of, there you go. Okay, let's take a look at the data platforms now. And there's a couple data platforms. We've got SQL structured data services. We've got un, uh, NoSQL data services. In the structured space, what I'm gonna highlight here is our push to the edge. And this is part of our vision of consistent programming models, consistent services from the big cloud through Azure Stack, through things like Databox Edge, down to Raspberry Pis, and even as much as we can push down into Azure Sphere class devices. So you can write code once and take it wherever you want to. Obviously, a big part of that vision is realized with containers, because more of these, most of these platforms now support containers, and that's a very convenient way to package not just your code, but your dependencies with that code which is important when you're pushing it out to a device in a very lightweight manner. What we've announced this week, you, uh, and I think you probably heard about it if you went to one of the keynotes, is Azure SQL Database Edge. What this is, is not we've actually had SQL Server in a container for some time. There's some key differences between this and just the standard SQL in a container. One of them is the fact that it works on ARM64 devices, because so many Edge IoT devices are ARM64 based. The second is that it's got built-in capabilities designed specifically for Edge. For example, it supports streaming service built on Azure Stream Analytics that's been baked into SQL Server to be able to stream data into it and do ML on that data, because intelligence at the edge is also a key theme. And the other one is that it can do sync it's got built-in synchronizers, too, to be able to synchronize up into a public cloud, a Cosmos DB, SQL Server, Azure Storage, because in mo many cases, as you're pulling data in from the edge, at least some of that data you want to send up to the cloud. And so this, with this streaming capability of streaming data into the SQL engine, doing ML on it or process query processing on it, and then taking results, aggregated results or filtered results, and sending that back up to the cloud is really what this is all about. Small footprint made for edge devices. Now, in this NoSQL structured, unstructured space, we've been doing, obviously, adding capability after capability onto Cosmos DB. And what you've seen over time is Cosmos DB, which started with a SQL JSON API that was called Document DB API, and that's what Cosmos DB was originally named, in that spirit of taking the same engine and adding multiple APIs on top of it, so each API gets all of the benefits of that underlying infrastructure. In the case of Cosmos DB, it means replicating a single database to any of our, and any or all of our public regions with just a, a few clicks of a mouse or a call to an API to say replicate my database to all 28 public regions of Azure. 
do specifying consistency models or levels for a database or individual APIs calls uh, with five consistency levels with very tight SLAs of 99.9 .9 reads and writes complete in under 10 milliseconds. All of that applies to all of these different APIs. And there's document APIs, there's key value APIs. You can see there's column-based APIs and graph-based APIs. And this list continues to grow. In fact, this week at Build, we announced etcd, which is the back end for Kubernetes. It's a key value API. And now this is the back end for Azure Container uh, Kubernetes service. And then we also announced Spark. So now you can do Spark queries right on your Cosmos DB data. One of the things that I've always asked them to do is, is hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could write the data using one API, read it using another one? or write and read the same data using different APIs. That would be really, really cool. So we're excited to say that we now support that. Cosmos DB supports multi-model access to the same data. And what I'm going to show you is a quick demo of that. So first, if we go to the dashboard here and go to my Cosmos DB database. What I'm going to do is go to the Data Explorer, and this will show me that I've got basically an empty d database. Now, I've got an application here. This application, I'll show you the source code to it, does a few things. One of the things that it does is it opens the same database using the Document DB API, or the JSON, it's also called the JSON SQL API, and the Gremlin Graph API. This is actually taking the same database, two different endpoints pointing at the same data, accessing, creating clients for both of these APIs, and then it's going to perform some operations, first with one API, then the, sec then the next API. Let's go watch that in action. So it's, here it's setting up the collection. Now it's inserted a bunch of documents. Now if I go back, just to show you that we have in fact inserted a bunch of documents, here it is. Here's that collection. And if I do a new SQL query, and here's my SQL query that I'm going to perform, which is going to do a, a JSON SQL query on that data. I guess I need to use my, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, it looks like portal, uh, here, let me try that again. Oops. And then I do execute query. You can see here the documents that I've just inserted. Now that's kind of cool, but if I go back to the graph view, you can see there's a graph view now, and I execute the standard gremlin query just to dump the whole graph, you can see that the graph is empty. But remember that we just saw that I have the API also leverage Gremlin. So now I, or that API document, uh, that application's leveraging Gremlin. It's inserting a bunch of edges and nodes on top of those objects that are in document DB form. And I come back, and what I do is I re-execute that query. and take a look, and there we go. So accessing the same data with two different APIs. So again, that theme, multiple APIs actually, uh, on top of the same data and being able to access that data using any API. Now I got one final section here, and this one is about AI on the edge, uh, specifically. So AI in the cloud, of course, we've got a whole set of services from our Azure Machine Learning, which includes workspaces for setting up experiments, managing data, training, and the models, and spitting them out as uh, containers or spitting them out as web services. We also have the Cognitive APIs. It's a suite now of ever-increasing number. It's probably around 30 different APIs, speech-to-text, text-to-speech, language understanding, search, knowledge, recommendations, anomaly detection, and the list goes on and on. Our vision here, again, consistent with taking apps, from the cloud to the edge is taking AI from cloud to the edge. And there's a few ways that we're enabling that. One of them is through IoT Edge 
runtime and the platform that provides. You can take IoT Edge runtime and put it on any device and connect it to IoT Hub, and at that point, you can deploy modules to the device. It could be a Windows laptop, it could be a Raspberry Pi, and you can deploy modules, binary pieces of code, you can deploy containers, you can deploy Azure Functions. In the future, you'll be able to deploy full-scale applications of microservices out to IoT Edge runtime. Now, we build IoT Edge runtime into this appliance, which a lot of our customers have asked for. Hey, I, I'm going to do processing on the edge. My concern is data privacy or the amount of data that's being collected that I need to go and process, and I don't want to send that all up to the cloud. Um, in fact, in many cases, not just privacy, but I want the edge scenario to work even when the cloud's not accessible. So we've created several hardware appliances, one of them here, Databox Edge has IoT runtime built into it, has support for the Onyx runtime, has an FPGA in it to support our brainwave inference, real-time inference, AI inference on the edge, built on top of those FPGAs. There's the Intel Area 10 FPGA. And now what customers can do is stream data into that data box edge and then do AI processing right there and then interact with the local environment, sending up uh, data that has low accuracy detection by the AI up to the cloud or sending aggregations or, uh, or backups up to the cloud. One of the examples of customer that you've heard us talk about here is Kroger that's putting these in the stores. And there's two scenarios there. One, they need to operate disconnected. Two, huge amounts of video data coming off the store they want to process locally. And three, actually three scenarios, three, data privacy, customer privacy. They don't want images of their customers going, leaving the store. Customers in the store, they value the, st the customer's privacy. You're gonna see us do more and more of this is push those capabilities out into devices like this. Now, the other one that we're excited about, and this, this one we've had lots of customers ask us for, hey, your cognitive APIs are really cool. The speech to text, text to speech, you might have seen a demo of one of those earlier, language understanding. We wanna be able to take those out to the edge. And the reason why is privacy or regulation or bandwidth or latency. We need to have that stuff happen there. And so we've been starting over the last few months of taking our cognitive APIs, packaging them as containers, and making it available for you to take out of Azure and take to your own data center or take to an EdgeUp device. And the full richness of those APIs and so I'm gonna show you a demo which ties another piece of Azure hardware, Azure Connect, together with the cognitive API that we've announced or released this week, the face recognition API, and show you the power of edge computing uh, with, uh, with Azure. So what I'm gonna do here is Here I've got this Connect, Azure Connect device up here. And you can see it's just uh, acting as a, st a standard camera, although it, hold on one second, I have to do this with two hands. Uh, you can see that on the bottom left there, it says online in blue. On the bottom right, it's showing us a depth sensor, which is built into Azure Connect. And if I'm within 400 millimeters, it's cool. If I'm outside, it says red. But you can see that it, there's no detection of me being here. So let's go and do a couple things. One is we're gonna disconnect this from the network. So if you look at the lower right corner, you see that we're disconnected now from the network. Now what I'm gonna do is show you uh, some pictures of some people that I really like and we're gonna see that it doesn't detect them either. So does any, anybody recognize these people? <laughs> Actually, there's one there. You see the only one in color? That's because he demanded that his be in color. <laughs> That's Corey Sanders. Uh, so he was uh, Tuesdays with Corey. He was uh, Azure Compute PM. Now he's out in the, the sales, the field. He's now on the sales team, technical sales, running that. So I'm really disappointed and annoyed that he left. So we're going to mess with him. So one of the things we're going to do is a bulk enrollment 
of labeled images. And um, here's Corey. What should we call him? Just want to show you that this is a lot real live labeling of this data. Great? No. Oh, what? Drake? Uh, he would like that, unfortunately. All right, now what I'm going to do is a bulk enroll of the app, on the app, which is it's going to point to that directory, take in those images. Oh, you know what? I forgot to do one thing. Run the Docker container with the Cognitive API in it. And actually, once I've done that, oh, it's going to take a second to launch up here. OK, now it should detect my face at least. And there we go. So Cognitive API. And how is it doing this, by the way? Here's the source code for this, that part of the Connect app that is talking to that container. What I want to highlight here is that you can see a subscription key, and then you can see two URLs, container URA base and Azure base. One's pointing at a lo localhost, and the other one's pointing at the Cognitive API endpoint. Otherwise, the code is exactly the same. So you can take your code, deploy it on the edge, and use the local Cognitive API. You can take it, and if you want to, use the Azure Service API without any changes to the code, simply changing the URL. And so here's the get and set for the URL so that this code can be dynamically updated to point at either one. Now, of course, I've got it pointing at the local one, so we're go going to go back to our bulk and roll here. And there's Drake. So power of Azure taken out to the edge and Azure services and um, misplaced my clicker. Um, but that's okay because we're on the last slide. So with that, I want to just recap what we've gone through kind of really quickly. We started with data centers. We looked at some servers, some liquid cooling. We took a look at Azure Resource Manager, the, ex the capabilities that we're adding there to make it possible for ISVs to extend and leverage Azure Resource Manager. We talked about Azure Storage and the way that the trend of pushing compute down to data to stop data from having to be pulled out. We took a look at SQL on the edge. We took a look at Cosmos DB and the multi-model aspect, which is another trend across our data services that you'll see. And then finally, we took a look at AI. Uh, and then don't forget that we looked at a piece of glass that was heavily abused and still readable. So I. Again, um, I'm sorry that I can't spend another couple hours with you showing you all the things that I had to cut that were really cool, but I hope this gives you a sense for the breadth of things that we're doing and the kind of innovation that we've got going on across the whole spectrum of the platform from cloud out to Intelligent Edge. I hope you have a, a great build. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, hopefully I'll see you at Ignite in a few months. Thanks. <laughs>